All right. Uh, thank you, Kelvin. Um, I can hand this to Motaha to start us off. Um, yes, so hi, everyone. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and good day to wherever it is you're joining us from. Welcome to yet another edition of what is our convening that is called Last Thursdays. We are so excited to be having you here today. I can see a couple more people are joining, but we are excited for this conversation. Um, before we begin, I'd just like to uh, in the chat box, uh, invite everyone to just introduce themselves. Uh, and we have a quick uh, icebreaker question. And our icebreaker question today is, if Africa had animal representations, what animals would various countries have and why? I ask again, if Africa had animal representations, what uh, animals would various countries have and why? And I have also posted that to everyone in the chat box. So feel free to uh, you know, put in your answers, uh, be as wild as possible. Um, and I will begin um, for me. I think Kenya would have, <laughs> don't hate me for this one. This is, this is, by the way, this is not reflective of development dynamics. This is all personal choices. And so on a personal level, as Rashid David Mutaha, uh, Kenya would be a, hey, 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 this is a tough one. So I'm sorry, why there I can see you laughing because you know what I'm about to say, but Kenya would be a hyena. Uh, <laughs> because that is where we have gotten to at the moment. But in real life, I believe Kenya would be a lion. Um, you know, we always say the lion is a king of the, I wouldn't call it a jungle, I'd call it the savannah. And uh, as one of the moving forces of the East African um, region, Kenya has always been at the forefront of whether it's uh, technological advances, uh, entrepreneurship, um, talking about conversations on climate health, reproductive health, we've always been leading the charge. And so as the lion being the king of the savannah, I believe Kenya uh, would be a lion. And so I invite you all in the chat box uh, to just share if Africa had animal representations, what animals would various countries have and why? Um, please follow my second example. My first one was a very biased one. Uh, it is a tough day, uh, but here we are and we love it. I see Dr. Kastindi has um, uh, written that Somalia would be a giraffe, the longest coast and their long hand in region business. I love that. I absolutely love that. And you can see it in so many different countries, uh, including our own country, Kenya. Uh, you can see it happening even in different uh, states in the United States of America. And so, and yes, they do have one of the longest coastlines uh, in Africa. So again, to everyone, please do share uh, your thoughts on the chat box um, and we can get to know each other. You can also say where it is you're joining us from today. Um, what's the weather like? Uh, it's really hot in Nairobi today. Uh, so we are, uh, we're saying we're enjoying our summer. <laughs> but yeah, so once again, welcome to um, the October edition of The Last Thursdays. We are joined by such an amazing panel of people today and we're excited to hear what it is that they have. If you are joining us for the first time, allow me to introduce what Last Thursdays is all about. Um, as development dynamics, we believe in the aspect of convening leaders, convening peers, um, and connecting conversations around uh, just what it is that is happening in the social impact sector, not only in the East African region, but in the African region and in the world. Uh, we want to create a space where we are able to share learnings, we are able to uh, connect conversations. What is happening in Africa or in Kenya today is not um, just a siloed conversation. It's a conversation that has regional impact. What is conversations that are happening at the United Nations, that are happening at the African Union, have 
um, a ripple effect in different aspects and it's contextualized in our country. And so we have this convening that is known as the last Thursdays where we get to just share around that, where we get to learn from each other, where we get to get the insights and understand how is it that for us in our own context, we can have this conversation happening. And this month in October, we're talking about the pact of the future, which has been a conversation that has been trending for the last month. Understanding um, as we continue and we continue talking about the sustainable development goals and the next step for that, what is it that is emerging for that? But it's such a wide conversation. And for this time, we really are focusing it a bit more. And here we're talking about what next for the African woman. And so I want to thank you all our dear participants for joining us. I want to thank our panelists who will be sharing their experience, their ideas, their views on what next for the African woman. A few do's and don'ts for us um, during this session. Uh, again, we welcome you to the last Thursdays. Well, first thing is that uh, we invite you to interact either on the chat space. If you have a question for any of the panelists for the host, um, just utilize the chat space for that. Uh, as you join, please ensure that you're on mute. And I'm sure on the back end, we have a team that is very ready and willing to just control all of the settings for that. We also have a team that is following the conversation and ensuring that any questions you may have, um, any uh, ideas that you throw into the chat space are well um, captured. And so no conversation will be missing. Uh, so again, thank you very much to our panelists. Thank you very much to everybody who is joining the session today. We are excited to be having you here, to be hosting you and to just ensure that we really learn from each other and uh, you know keep on moving a step forward towards creating a sustainable future for us. At this juncture, I want to invite the very amazing, very able, very dope host that we have for this session today. Um, sometimes she likes to call herself a fiery woman, but deep down inside her heart, she's a very passionate um, lady. Uh, she is the senior advisor for democracy, peace and governance. And when she's not leading conversations around governance, she's at home being an amazing mother and, uh, you know, her hair is red at the moment, so she's very fired when it comes to this conversation. So, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to invite Waidera Kibinda, who shall be our host for this session. Waidera, over to you. Thank you, Mutaha. Your check is in the mailbox, for sure. <laughs> and what a better way to butter me up. End month. Uh, well done. Yeah, yeah, you're very strategic. But thank you very much, Mr. Mutaha. Yes, uh, my name is Wedera Kibinda. I head the Democracy and Governance Unit here at Development Dynamics. I also uh, consider myself a conversation starter and thought provoker. And uh, yeah, that, that makes, uh, I'm never, uh, what, a deal, uh, yes, I'll always talk about what, what's, what's important. And I am very, social justice oriented. Uh, that said, I think if Kenya was an animal, she would be an elephant. Uh, when she's happy, everyone is happy. And if she's angry, you cannot ignore her. Uh, so I am joined by various wonderful uh, women, amazing women in this continent. I want to first um, just one around to Welcome, Barbara Kilei, all the way. I think she's joining us from Uganda. She's an advocate of the High Court, a certified arbitrator, a certified mediator, one international um, NGO doing amazing things, and she'll tell us more about it. So, Barbara, you can wave at us, and then uh, we can see you. Yes, that's that's Barbara. Thank you very much. I am also joined by Grace Irongo, all the way in uh, Mombasa. So I guess she shares a coastline with the giraffe people. Uh, Grace is an educator and ed tech advocate, changing young minds uh, in the area of education. So Grace, you can uh, wave at us, put your camera on, wave at us. 
and so we can be able to see you and know you. Um, is, is Grace here? Oh, yes. Thank you, Grace. We see you all the way from Mombasa, Asante. Uh, I'm also joined. We are also joined by Rutendo Nyaku. Um, and I'm happy. I'm grateful because the future is bright and is, is worth looking forward to because of young, fresh minds. And Rutendo is a rule of law advisor and a research associate. She'll be telling us more about it. So hi, Rutendo, you can wave at us or allow me to be stereotypical and give us the Gen Z up this time. Is, that, is this a platform? No? Another one? <laughs> this is not a platform. Oh, yes, there you go. Thank you, Rutendo. Thank you so much. I am also joined by the very amazing uh, Dr. Katindi. Dr. Katindi is amongst the seven, I, I don't know if you're anymore, you'll correct us, futurists in the continent and doing amazing work in that field and a systems thinker. So, Dr. Terry, you can wave at us and uh, we, can, we can see. Yes, it's only who's giving me an African mom side eye <laughs> thank you thank you katini so i want us to get right into it and so i'll ask our panelists to briefly uh introduce themselves and i'm gonna start with you dr katini as your father introduces to you let us know how can foresight research help countries avoid common pitfalls in implement, implementing the commitments they have done during the Pact of the Future. So um, what I need to do first, I guess, before we get into that, is give a brief bio of how we got here. I think that's a good place to, to start. While we are talking about the Pact of the Future, oh my God, I was just ready to go. Um, <laughs> so, so a long time ago, a long time ago, as early as the 1940s, the UN is formed and um, many conversations, we can move to the next slide. Um, so th there are various conversations happening and women rights are a thing. Everyone is talking about women rights. And then um, in 1948 in Paris, people gather, and again, the conversation at the UN General Assembly is on the rights of people and Article 1 takes the day because it says all human beings are born free and equal in dignity and in rights. And thus now begins a, more con a, a greater conversation about women involvement, how are they here? How are we going to put them as part of the plan? Then in, uh, in 1975, a big conference is held in Mexico and the themes again, some of the themes arising are on women's rights and um, development. And therein results something called the Mexico City Plan of Action that is still pushing about equal rights and the importance of women role in development. You'll think like this something obvious, but clearly that's why years, decades later, we still have the, the conversation um, happening. In the 1980s, uh, specifically, yeah, we have the Second World Conference on Women in Copenhagen, Denmark, and again, the themes involved, uh, evolving around discrimination, um, having women involved in development. They signed something called the Copenhagen Declaration, which again is just a reaffirmation of what has been spoken about 30 years before. You'll think we'd get it, right? No. So in uh, 1985, and I remember this very clearly because I was a young girl and I was excited. There was just some energy in, in Nairobi and uh, seeing uh, various political leaders, women um, out at it. And we had the Nairobi con conference and um, 
we, it gave us the Nairobi forward-looking strategies for the advancement of women. Again, women, women, women. So it laid a foundation for the commitment that countries had uh, towards women involvement, again, in development, uh, dealing with matters in equality and discrimination. Allow me sips water. <laughs> Then in the 2000s, guess what, guys? They finally, they finally figured it out. I promise you, they finally figured it out. And we have the Millennium Development Goals. New York, let's talk about global development. And they have eight, eight amazing things that you'll think, oh, wow, this is it. This is our step now, finally, to world peace. And we adopt, and uh, goal number three was about promoting gender equality and empower women. And this is a term I think now buzzwords are coming, empowering, empowerment, women involvement, inclusion, all these things. Uh, but then, guess what? Between 2000 and 2015, they realized they don't have it. They don't got it. And so we have other, other conversations and they are critiquing what the millennium, the gaps in the millennium development goals. And they realized time was uh, running out. So again, lovely papers are developed on focusing on gender equality. And it's about, uh, it's not just about numbers, but the quality and rights of women. Um, and so this was a conversation. And in 2015, because we thought eight were not comprehensive enough, we have 17 new goals, what we call the sustainable development goals. My God, if we have not achieved the world peace by now, I have no idea. And it's clear again, women are involved, equality, discrimination, uh, climate change, everything that would affect uh, women and women conversation. Goal number five, achieve gender equality and empower all women and girls. And I'm glad that Grace is here. She'll give us figures and Barbara as well. Are, are we there yet? Have we gotten there? So this is supposed to be achieved sometime by 2030, which uh, give or take is uh, how many years are we? Uh, six years. and. <laughs> well, they thought time is running out. So in 2024, this year, oh wait, just before we get into this year, in uh, 2015, the African Union uh, comes together and they have the 2063 uh, Agenda 2063. And it's a strategic framework of how Africa can thrive, getting solutions from within transformation, let's talk about peace. And then part of that conversation also involves empowering women and gender equality. Then this year, in, uh, in 2024, uh, September, just a few months ago, the many countries again come together in the UN and uh, Dr. Katindi was just happened to pass by and share the same oxygen in September. So maybe she'll highlight a bit about that. And the pact of the future is formed. So the amazing thing about this pact now is that it's embracing not only equality, but also matters technology. It also has a few uh, key, key development goals, climate change, digital cooperation, human rights, gender and youth and future generations. And I'm sure that's why Dr. Katindi was excited when she had the word futures. And ladies and gentlemen, that is how we landed to the pact of the future. So we sat down and asked ourselves hard questions. So it sounds big out there, very grand, very beautiful, very amazing. But how does it translate to that woman in Kenya in a remote county in a very small ward or a woman in West Africa living in the most remotest of village? Or, so how does it translate that? The pact of the future is also concerned about you. 
is concerned about the young people, is concerned about tech and how it will improve your life. And that is why, ladies and gentlemen, this conversation, what next for the African woman after the Pact of the Future, was birthed. If we are up to date, please, you can give me a thumbs up. Then I can know, okay, I, I did not talk. I communicated as, as well. And uh, that's where we are coming to you, Dr. Katind. We'll start with you. How can foresight and its research narrow this down to me, you know, at the most remotest of places? to understand what is happening. And as you do that, please also introduce uh, yourself to us and a bit of what you do. Thank you, Kari Bosana. Thank you very much. Just confirm that you can hear me. Our network was very unstable earlier, so please let me know if I'm not very clear. So as you've been told, my name is Dr. TV, and I am an Afrifuturist. Um, what that means is I do future work and my preference is trying to get this across Africa because I think um, Africa with all the disadvantages it has and opportunities could use quite a lot of um, leverage using foresight. But apart from that, um, I teach at, the, uh, at Strathmore University, but I'm here in my personal capacity. At some point, I also work with the UN to try and help mainstream foresight and uh, in relation to the, for the future mainstream that within governments and also within the UN agencies. So in terms of the, um, the question that you ask, allow me to just well give a background on two issues. The first one is the question around um, gender. And the question around gender is very interesting. As And I really like the highlights you've given about the global space and just the history of global pacts, right? And global conversations and how they trickle down. And this is only to say that um, perhaps not even to get very speci uh, to specifics about gender is the fact that um, we live in an ecosystem. We are not in isolation. And so what's going on elsewhere comes a part of what we do. So think about COVID, think about all this, um, you know, global conversations and how they're implemented locally. And so uh, the Pact for the Future is not any different. And just to mention that the Secretary General launched what is called our common agenda. And it was basically a conversation in the UN to try and figure out the global challenges that have continued to persist despite all those previous conversations and how to strengthen multilateralism. Because the point to make here is that these issues now, there's much more uh, argument that the world is changing much faster, the disruptions are bigger, but also the fact that those disruptions do not happen in isolation, that they are interconnected. So what happens here will affect the world and vice versa. So think about climate change. What you do upstream affects what what is what happens upstream, even if the person did not have anything to do with it. So based on that, then the question mm. became, how do we put together a framework that begins to acknowledge that interconnection? And there were mainly four main areas that were seen as so important. The first is the whole question around the financial and governance systems. And the financial systems, allow me to say that those are important because if you think about African countries and the question of debt, I mean, um, it has gone to unsustainable levels. First of all, a lot of uh, these African countries are not, you know, um, you know, included in some of these decision-making platforms. Uh, when it comes to borrowing, we have very unfair terms compared to other people who borrow, and yet um, we have resources that are going out in terms of international um, financial flows that are, you know, unfair in many ways. So our resources are being taken at fair mm -hmm. advantage um, to us, and we are not getting the the right compensation for them. Of course, that's not entirely up to the international community because our own governments have a role to play in that. But the second one is a big question around um, the future generations. And future generation is understanding that we are making decisions. So there's another connection. So apart from global to local, there's a connection between um, you know, the decisions, what happened in the past affects what's happening today and obviously has an, uh, a consequence for, for the future. But having said that then, yeah, because of the issue of interconnectedness, we are 
now making decisions that are not just affecting us, but are going to affect future generations. So think about the question of international financing that I talked about, where we borrow, mm -hmm. but now it's future generations who are not even born that are already indebted. They say in Kenya, um, for example, that uh, the, un the young people or the unborn have at least 50,000 plus on their heads, and yet they, they were not even doing that decision. So how do we connect the past, present, and future so that we also save mm -hmm. the life born? And so this question of future issues is an important one that begins to ask us, how do we become responsible for the decision we make now mm -hmm. so that we advantage future generation? So yeah. now to your mm -hmm. question, I think background, but to your question, um, so how can foresight and research countries avoid common pitfalls? Uh, first of all, I think foresight in itself, which is a study of the future and then figuring out how the future might pan out and how we then um, use that information to try and make strategic decisions. I think the first is the fact that foresight acknowledges the limitations of past models. I think we are now coming to terms, is coming to terms with, if we are so interconnected, if we keep up with these unfair laws, discrimination, what begins to happen is we don't just disadvantage the people we, we discriminate against because it comes back to us. So think climate change. Think, um, you know, um, we industrialize using all this, you know, um, we pollute the air in so many ways, but now all of us are affected. So we have to acknowledge the limitations of those past models and begin to correct that. And that's the right thing to do, because if we don't, the unfortunate thing is that the past is connected to the present and, like I said, to the future. The second thing is this whole question about identifying risks. So foresight is about risk management, if you may. And we are always monitoring what are the things that we need to be paying attention to. And so one mm. of the in about um, implementing the pact for the future is acknowledging that there are many things, again, that are happening around us, a lot of changes that are going on. And... A lot of solutions actually we have uh, we have are twentieth century solutions, um, and we haven't invented invented fully invented twenty first century solutions. So the question becomes: with all these disruptions, with all these complex challenges that are happening, how do we identify the risks that are going to uh, fully be realized, if you may, in the future? And how do we start um, monitoring that, inventing solutions for that, mm -hmm. and beginning proactively? Um, figure out solutions for things that are yet to come. The third one is mm -hmm. preparing for future probabilities because what we are saying is that the complexities of this where we are today are producing mm -hmm. new dynamics. So how do we anticipate that so that we are not caught flat-footed and so that again we start being proactive. The last one so that I don't hog the whole space is the question around setting future and relevant goals and ideal solutions, which is connected to what I'm saying, inventing 21st century. Mm. Now the process of foresight, so that's the product of foresight. The process of foresight is something very interesting and it begins to answer your question around the in, the, prog the impact of this, um, this pact for the future on people, real people like women, is the fact that a process like foresight acknowledges that the future belongs to all of us. So it's not for some of us, as the as mm -hmm. the past has mm -hmm. been. The second thing is that mm -hmm. then through a foresight process, we have to democratize that future and begin to have very uh, deliberate conversations about how do we involve all stakeholders in this conversation. But then the second thing is mm -hmm. then it's about we earlier on and the twentieth century issues used to work on problems mm -hmm. from a linear perspective. A linear perspective means if I'm an, an engineer, I look at things only with that eye. But the 21st century problems are asking us to be intersectional. That intersectionality means that all of us, men, women, children, youth, etc., have to be involved and all disciplines have to be involved. That, that foresight helps us and advantages us in that way. And the last thing is ensuring that, um, you know, future relevant policies are contextualized. So we can do a part of the future at the global level, but obviously this mm -hmm. is a very different from a lot of the conceptualizations even out mm -hmm. there. So 
how do we intentionally contextualize those conversations so that as much as we are part of we also are part of a local reality that we live in. Thank you. Either let me leave it there and give the rest a chance. Thank you, Dr. Terry. Thank you. I love what you say is that it's for the real people. It's not for those guys and then other guys. So it's for the real people. Thank you very much. I want to ask Barbara uh, a question uh, because of your background in rule of law and working with international labor organizations. So how can the commitments that have already been done strengthen the, co the connection? And uh, Katinda has mentioned a lot of these, a lot of interconnectedness in everything that we are doing. So strengthen the connection between legal reforms and economic opportunities uh, for me or for us as African women. Thank you, Aydera. Maybe just to start, it's the International Development Law Organization. Very many times people confuse us with the International Labor Organization. IDLO is an intergovernmental organization that is treaty-based and focuses on rule of law. That said, I am here in my personal capacity, and therefore these are my statements and my thoughts, and uh, thank you for inviting me. Um, maybe just before I begin on discussing how the commitments that have been made during the Pact of the Future can strengthen the connection between legal reforms and economic development, I think it's important that we first understand the connection itself between law and sustainable development. Now, there can be no sustainable development if there is no um, reliable, or if I may say so, an enabling environment that calls for the respect of, of um, legal processes. You cannot have, for example, arbitrary decisions being made in businesses because that will affect the contractual relationship that parties have with each other. So the rule of law is very important in making sure that everyone shall be subject to the same procedures and processes when interpreted, interpreting contractual terms, make, making it very predictable for business entities to get into uh, the different businesses, knowing that at no point will an arbitrary decision be made by any individual or any state and therefore put their investment at risk. Given that, then of course, legal reform become very critical to promote uh, sustainable development. And when you talk about sustainable development, it's not just in the how we do the business, but it's also in the, the actual businesses themselves in being um, uh, looking towards the future so that they have more of, uh, uh, what's that term called when you, you have, um, the, the, the business itself is a going concern. It doesn't stop being a going concern because you have either changes in management or you have changes in uh, regulation or, or in the environment. So it makes it very important that when you're looking at sustainability, you're looking at all forms of sustainability. So the business itself is a going concern, the impact of the business in terms of climate, in terms of uh, future generations being able to uh, contribute to um, the goals, for example, the 2030 goals in reducing um, uh, the level of um, um, emissions in the world and also to the question of whether um, it is a good business in terms of uh, adherence to economic practices and good governance principles. So um, in, for purposes of this discussion, we're looking at the African woman and how this can then this type of environment then affects her. You find that women either uh, be entrepreneurs, uh, micro and small, or even large companies, and also they are part of the workforce. So you want an, a legal environment that protects their interests, that makes sure that they're not being abused in their in the environment of work or in the environment that they're using for business enterprises. And this then makes it very important for us to look at the different kind of laws that exist. So for example, ensuring that there are no discriminatory laws um, against women owned businesses or women uh, enterprises that employ majorly uh, women as the labor providers. So for example, you would look at 
uh, uh, plantation farms where you find majority of the laborers could be women, you want to make sure that they have a safe, safe space. So you'd be looking at labor laws that govern hours of working, conditions of working, mm -hmm. uh, pro protective gear. You also want to make sure that they have access to some of the laws, I mean, some of the rights that are protected. For example, a woman working in a plantation, how much time of maternity leave can she be given? And would she be guaranteed her position back after the maternity leave, you will find that because this being a mm -hmm. casual laborer, the uh, most default position is once you get pregnant, that's it, your job is lost. And that is not how the Pact of the Future is looking at the role of women. Because remember, the Pact of the Future places a very strong emphasis on gender equality and empowerment of all women and girls. And this is very crucial for Africa because Africa have historically faced significant challenges, but have also been the very critical players or rather have played very critical roles in enhancing the continent's development. This could either be through agriculture, this could be either through their various uh, SMEs that they own or the large companies that they own. So it's important that, for example, even when you're looking at the different uh, role that the women are playing, you're also taking into consideration a good example would be the What African Women Want campaign that is by the African Union, which sets a clear actionable roadmap for gender equality and women empowerment across mm -hmm. the continent. Mm -hmm. A story is told, I think, uh, of how very many people say, if you uh, empower a woman, you have empowered a whole village. Um, mm -hmm. I will not say what the converse is because we are yet to see it, because all of us are products of very successful empowered women, either they were resilient in their uh, focus or in their interest in us uh, pursuing our education, or they were resilient in their drive for us to have better futures than they had before. So the rule of law and legal reforms that ensure that the removal of any discriminatory norms or laws then are dealt with, or we have a very um, gender, sensitive or rather gender um, responsive, I think that's the correct word, a gender responsive legal framework, then we'll be creating um, an enabling environment for doing business. I think when you look at the various laws that we have in Africa, most of them are very gender blind because they don't talk about, they don't give women specific rights and, and, and responsibilities. So it is important that in the review of these laws, especially in light of the Pact of the Future, if we are serious about it as Africa, is that we must look at it from a gender lens and look at the nuances that actually prohibit women from being um, uh, recognized significant key role players in promoting the different types of businesses that we have that can then contribute to economic independence within Africa. Now, uh, Waidera, one of the key things that I always find challenging is that when we're talking about um, economic empowerment for women, we tend to look at agriculture and, and think that that is where the women are placed, but that's not true mm -hmm. because of late, we have been seeing women becoming industrial leaders in different um, types of industries. For example, in the digital field, we're finding very many women in the tech. We're finding very many women. The other day, I was very impressed when I saw a lady driver doing um, what they call um, the drifting. Uh, so she was one of the drifters and, and, and I was very impressed because I'd never seen a lady drifter before and, and that gave me hope. Uh, that surely in the near future, we will not be looking at whether or not we are trying to bring women up. The question would be, okay, now that we are all here, what more can we do to improve uh, mm. the, the livelihoods that we all have, to improve the economic uh, capacity of our, different, of our different countries so that Africa as it is, as rich as we are in Africa, we would be the ones um, setting the pace for the rest of the world. I think I'll stop there and just hand it over back to you. Otherwise, I think I can continue for the rest of the day. Thank you, Aida. Thank you, Barbara. That is very insightful. And it will, I like what you say that even the rule of law is, is just emphasizing what Katinja said. It's not for some people and other people. Maternity leave. 
protective wear uh, showing up, you know, and there are new things that are coming up every day. And that women are, should not only be in the silo of agriculture and climate. So I think then that takes me to Grace uh, in her edu tech <laughs> advocacy. You can narrow it down and tell us what does that mean? But also a challenge picking up from what Barbara has said. How can women just move um, above uh, to just stop being participants and uh, consumers, but really get involved with digital and tech matters to advance their development uh, from the conversation on the past? <laughs> Well, good evening and hello. Uh, thank you so much, Waitera. Uh, Grace Sirongo is the name, and um, I'm working towards answering the question of uh, how can we use digital tools for inclusive learning? Now, I'm just linking up uh, what the two previous speakers have said, where when you're looking at uh, the macro versus um, the micro versus macro, or whatever it is we're doing in the global front, and how can we contextualize it or have it as contextualized as possible? And there's one thing that even as we are working towards Agenda 2063, we're working towards uh, Vision 2030, there is one thing we have to uh, accept. Education and technology are at the very heart of whatever it is. And there is one thing now that we are having, um, I loved what uh, Dr. Katindi said uh, when we are looking at the 20th century, but now when we are in school here and now we're even introducing the CBC, we are trying to bring about the qualities of the 21st century because we are living in a very fast paced world where everything is changing on a daily basis. So now you find we are trying to see how best can we, as we are bringing up these young students, uh, I'm a teacher by profession. I teach high school, uh, by the way. So now we're looking at how can we bring about these skills and now the skills we are looking at is one, communication too, we're looking at critical thinking. We have to have character and then there is a uh, creativity and collaboration. So now with those five C's, you're looking at how best can this child or care, how best can this girl come through? And now to answer your question as uh, some of the steps or the, the steps that we can ensure women are not just consumers, but they're also leaders and participators, especially when it comes to uh, innovation and tech space the very first thing is mentorship and role models. That, that's the one thing uh, when we have mentors, when we have role models, we start looking at how, who can they look up to? You know, Right now, uh, if you were to go out and just ask one of the young girls down there, who's your role model? You'll find we have all different types of, you know, and now this becomes, if I remember well, uh, role models or mentors used to be like, our aim, our goal, I want to be like so-and-so. So now when we look at uh, ensuring that our women or our, our girls are not just participators, not just consumers, we need to look at who are the mentors, who are the role models that we have, whether in a macro uh, pers uh, perspective, that's the global perspective. And then now we come down to the contextual, now the role, the role models right down to the community. Who are the girls looking up to so that now we can be able now to see how are we fostering leadership, how are we uh, fostering that confidence, how, how are we able to empower this girl, quote unquote, to be a leader and, you know, come up with the various uh, innovations that we are having. The other one is access. You know, after you've mentored this person, after you've given the role, you know, you, you have a role model, the next thing becomes access. And now this is not just access to uh, the skills or the funding. We are also looking at access to the various technologies. Right now we have technology moving at a very fast uh, uh, pace. And there's one thing we'll have to admit, uh, the first computer program was written by a woman, but then how comes we don't have women dominating the computer, the computer world, right? And uh, so now the question now becomes, what access are we giving? Is that so now? And then now access has to also go to funding. So now I know we have all these set aside affirmative actions and all that and all that. But then are we able to create a mechanism for female led startups, you know, that encourage entrepreneurship? Yes, we have the role models, we have the mentors. But then now when it comes down to it, are we able to encourage that? Are we able to mold that? 
And then once we have that, are we able now to recognize those, you know, uh, women who are in the various uh, industries and media, right? And I'm thankful, even here in Kenya, we have the various ways in which we recognize top 40 under 40. You know, the various mm -hmm. ways, uh, you know, when we come to the different counties, the different categories, right now we are loving the fact that it's multidisciplinary, so it's no longer silos, right? Uh, and I'm loving the fact that just this year I was able to attend uh, what we had, the Taikon Africa, the Technology Information Communication Conference of Africa that was held here in Kenya. And during that, they were actually launching the Women in ICT chapter for Africa. So now you can imagine there is that recognition. It's not so longer, it's not so long uh, those that we have ideas, you know, now we are looking at how do we do it, right? Because ultimately what we want by the time we are getting to 2030, by the time we're getting to 2063, we have been able to either bridge that gap between industry and education because there's a lot that is happening there and there's a very big gap. So how do we do that? And now you find the different communities are able to build that up, right? So now how we get that for me, I'm looking at mentorship and role model, access, mm. funding, and recognition. Like there are, allow me to close mm. on that one. Mm -hmm. I like it. I like it when you say money. Money is good. Money, money will help us remove a lot of things. But thank you also for, even when we have a conversation this week, you're talking about Pwani Innovation Week, Mombasa Innovation Week. Uh, so it's not only at national level, but it's being translated down to uh, counties. And therefore, even quote unquote, the least of us can be able to plug in and know how to um, innovate or how do I share my product with the world. So thank you very much, Chris. And I'm glad that you're here because then uh, you'll keep giving us the secrets and the opportunities. Um, I want to call upon Rutendo uh, next. Uh, I know she has been keenly following that conversation. Uh, first, as a young African woman, and also very passionate about the rule of law, but also an advocate of free trade. What specific opportunities are there for women and women entrepreneurs that could be one, discovered, strengthened, uh, and will ride on this commitment? Thanks, Waikira. Um, I'm actually glad that um, Grace spoke on the issue of access because I'm just going to hammer on that <laughs> as well <laughs> because you know what is access if it's not inclusion um, but I, I guess um, my my <laughs> my take on this one is just based on a um, you know a bit of it is based on a study that I published earlier in the year on the experiences of young people trading under the African continental free trade area already um, and so for this question, I want to focus more on the women in the informal cross, you know, informal cross-border trading, because I believe that they receive the least attention in these kinds of discourses that we're having today. Um, so for instance, the African Union, um, you know, published some study not too long ago on the opportunities for women under the F AFCFTA. And it revealed that those women, the women, the informal cross-border trading women, um, are the ones who are the most invisible. They face the most harassment and violence and discrimination when doing their work. Um, and mm -hmm. so when, when we're discussing the issues of the FCFTA and young you know, women and young women's participation, it's these voices that people in the middle class and people who are in the working class mm -hmm. need to actually include a bit more because they stand to be more vulnerable. Um, and I think they, they, they deserve um, greater attention. Um, so largely what stops these women from formalizing their trade, because it's already mm -hmm. ongoing. These are the same resilient women who are selling mm -hmm. the tomatoes and buying cross-border and taking mm -hmm. their kids to school. But they can't formalize mm -hmm. these businesses, access things like cre credit and certain support mechanisms because of the structural mm -hmm. nature of exclusion in our governments. Mm -hmm. So, for instance, in Sierra Leone, most recently, women could not access credit up until this point, well, could not effectively access credit mm -hmm. up until this point because of gender bias mm -hmm. in the financial services industry. Mm -hmm. And that's just mm -hmm. one example. And I think mm -hmm. when we're really talking about the opportunities under the AFCFTA, 
it's because it has a specific protocol on women and youth that seeks to address these structural issues of access and, mm. and women being able to access, you know, sort of um, financial support mechanisms, you know, your training, your literacy around business and being able to actually trade and formalize. So I think the mm. intentional nature of the protocol on women and youth is the actual opportunity that women have to really go from where, where we are, where it's just you're participating in the economy, but in an invisible way and actually participating in a much more visible way. I, I, I'd want to not say that women are not participating because that's not mm -hmm. true. Women are participating, but the visibility and strength of their voice in this participation is what's lacking. Um, so the problem, um, you know, the, 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 the problems of, of the AFCFTA largely is that it is it tends to be quite um, elitist. So conversations like we are having amongst ourselves, those who work, those who mm -hmm. degrees, and and and. Mm -hmm. um, but however, um, the, the, this problem, I I look at this problem of of women, uh, you know, women not being not being visible participants as an opportunity mm -hmm. for those who are working in the digital literacy space in banking and in finance. Um, I'm not uh, amongst people who are advocates and so on. I look at it as an opportunity to actually right the wrong, which is the actual exclusion mm -hmm. and marginalization mm -hmm. of women from these systems. Mm -hmm. um, I think mm -hmm. what we need to do is to create more platforms to allow women who are already trading to access the same opportunities as educated and middle-class mm -hmm. women, right? I think mm -hmm. the, the, the connection between between women in the middle class and who have all this education and training and connecting them to informal cross-border, you know, uh, traders and allowing them the conversations and exchange so that they too can access the same financing structures mm -hmm. would be very important. Mm -hmm. So in a nutshell, mm -hmm. say that, you know, the AFCFT promises access. I think that's the one thing about it. I was like, oh, leaders did that right, is that it does promise <laughs> access. Um, and that yeah. what what should remain the in, and that's what should remain the critical aspect. It should remain mm -hmm. the fact that the protocol and women should really, really push for the fact that the protocol is implemented effectively because that, that is the mm -hmm. only way to really guarantee that mm -hmm. this invisible participation increases mm -hmm. and women have a greater, you know, once you have economic power, you have a greater voice. <laughs> so yeah. That's what I would yeah. say about that, yeah. yeah. All right. Well, and I love just how you're passionate about it and you want to go on and on and on. So I want to pass the mic maybe one last time, uh, very briefly, so we can have a Q and A. Uh, also because again, African thing, time is not on our side. But please, <laughs> allow, allow me, and I will start with you, Rutendo, and then we'll pass the mic to someone else. And on to uh, you've spoken. I've, I've seen the picture for me clearly that we think we go through the same problem at the same time. But I probably have more access to finance uh, than the Mama Mboga, yet sometimes her role is very critical. So help us, challenge us in like two minutes. How do we move this traditional knowledge systems into modern policies? And I like what you said about Sierra Leone, maybe you have Another case you've worked with. Um, how do we bridge that gap and say, okay, we started a ne negative, and now we are moving here. So your question is the how do we put together the traditional? Yeah, how do we integrate traditional knowledge systems mm -hmm. into modern policy making? Yeah, uh, I systems, mean, yes. Oh, don't get me started, right? You know? <laughs> <laughs> but but I mean I, I would say I think essentially you know the question of visibility is is, is at the heart mm -hmm. of everything for me I think traditional knowledge systems for a long time were excluded due to just you know colonization and 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 so they've not they've not had the same storytelling that we've had in the movies in music in case studies in business schools that would actually be necessary and important and i think that's where the actual focus is so one example i can use and it's not necessarily business and trade related but look at um in in, in rwanda for instance one of the traditional mm. justice mechanisms that they've been uses is the gachacha courts right this is a traditional make but the storytelling around the gachacha courts has enabled the conversation within the conflict space 
to actually start thinking, you know, what indigenous justice practices can we actually use to, you know, reformulate what our meaning of access to justice is and, you know, the implementation of justice. And I think that's the same thing we need to carry over when it comes to, to trading, when it comes to business and inclusion of people. I think once there is a greater focus on making it visible and packaging it in a way where the people in capitalist spaces can be like, okay, 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 I can really find that thing. It's really about the language that you use, the imagery that you use, the kind of adjectives you use to describe these things so that they are more attractive to the people who hold the press strings. Well, thank you. And that was our up in two minutes. I love it. I it was in two it. minutes. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I want to give it to Dr. Terry as well. In two minutes, Doc. And because I saw your hand was also up. But I want to ask a question. Foresight and systems thinking. How do you integrate that into early warning systems and so that we build on peace and security? All right. So I this is me completely uh, going off track with your with your question to return of um <laughs> awesome. And just to build on that, because I think there's a very important point there to say is is the question around the structural issues that women face. And I think that's important just based on the core of this conversation. Um and, and the way we organized financing, even whether it's in country or even at the global level, I mean, it has disadvantaged women in many ways. Mm -hmm. Once I, I used to do gender budgeting. And one of the things that um, in an analysis that I was doing in one of those years, they actually had funded more a relocation of more elef of elephants. They had, had budgeted more money for relocating elephants than they had given cumulatively maternal health. And that was very appalling because I mean, one can argue, oh, we care for animals. There's nothing wrong with that. But there wasn't any indication that those animals were in danger or there was any need for relocation. And so for me, that question around to what extent we prioritize the needs of women becomes very important. Um, I did an analysis on the issue of affirmative action funds because those have been put in place to try and empower different groups of people that have been, you know, rendered disadvantaged. Mm -hmm. And I was um, analyzing the women's enterprise in Kenya, which is excellently executed in terms of, you know, money in, money out, right? But the interesting mm -hmm. thing and the targeted fund is that when you do an analysis and because of not targeting disadvantaged women, like, you know, young girls with disabilities in rural areas who then have multi multiple disadvantages, what we found is that the money actually was given more or was accessed more to advantaged women. The, the goal of the fund is to actually uh, do affirmative action to help women that are in disadvantaged positions to access these resources so that they can establish businesses and be empowered. So it actually was realizing the complete opposite. And so this structural question is not just at the global level, but at the local level. And just to show you the power of empowering women, I once had a story from the central bank governor, the former central bank governor, and he asked us a question. He asked, when is the highest loans taken in Kenya? And this uh, volume of loan is actually taken every morning at four o'clock. It is by women who are actually getting small loans to go to Marikiti, or which is um, the equivalent of, I don't know how to say that in English, uh, the market to go and get supply you know, uh, their, their veggies and all that small traders, and so that they are able to come in and sell. And the highest repayment is by same women by evening when they sell, because access to capital is not as adequate. And so it already tells you that if you actually have an ecosystem that works, you can really empower these women to really do it. Again, you ask for an example, the eco bank, the, the table banking system seen and we have stories of women that have done tremendous you know development projects when it comes to using the small monies and just you know keeping at it so that they're able to invest quite a lot and so again it, it's not a magic bullet it, these are things that could be you know be achieved but i think systemically we've just refused to be to be fair and we've refused to do the right thing in order to access this opportunity now I forget your question, which mm. was around, it was about foresight and? 
um, <laughs> and strategic thinking, early warning systems to peace and security. Because at the end of the day, uh, conflict affects, I think, women first. Okay, yes. So one of the things that is interesting is that, you know, we assume that peace is something that everybody wants. But when we acknowledge that actually the reason why conflict is never resolved is because you have people that profit from not having peace, then you begin to ask who's peace. And so early warning is, is a way of just asking this, what assumptions do we even make around of these concepts? What um, blind spots do we have even when we are resolving peace and security? And that's an important conversation that foresight can enable in peace and security. Mm -hmm. And also redefining some of these things. We were just talking, I was actually facilitating and the conflict conference um, over the weekend. And one of the things that was very powerful is the fact that we've designed peace and conflict projects to think about bullets and to think about the physical. And yet there's a lot of, you know, and seen conflict, whether it's mental, whether it's, mm -hmm. uh, you know, mm -hmm. uh, emotional stuff like that. So how do we also uh, uh, enlarge that conversation to accommodate some of those unseen things that mm -hmm. particularly affect, you know, children mm -hmm. and so forth. And of course, um, mm -hmm. question about analyzing conflict trends, because those are changing and they are, so what was traditionally uh, conflicts? We were saying, for example, in places like Capedo and, you know, Karamoja, you will have mm. conflict, what you a traditional, uh, can I say, process of amassing cows for wealth and to get married mm. now mm. has been a completely different ball game. So how do you mm. look at how they're through foresighting processes and how then do you acknowledge that in terms so that you're able to actually give a correct, you know, diagnosis even and then um, mm. deal with that from a foresight perspective? Then you're thinking mm. about um, the contexts of, 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 of conflict. Different regions face different conflicts. Mm. In the coast, for example, it much more terrorism as opposed to places, other places where it is cattle wrestling or climate or whatever it is. So that contextualization becomes very important because not all one solution doesn't, you know, feed all of them. But then I think the last thing is also this question about. Indig indigenous mechanisms of peace building. And we've seen that in many places where peace actually lasts, usually it is the women that have brokered that peace or they have enabled an ecosystem of that peace to dwell. So how do we also recognize these power systems that are not fully acknowledged in all these grandiose, you know, international spaces? How do we use those mechanisms to build peace and security for women and children because they become the sufferers of, of conflict. Thank you. All right. Thank you, and, Dr. Katide. Sorry, you froze. No. Take two. Okay, I said no, and, and foresight helps with that. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, and foresight helps helps with that, especially the unseen uh, what cannot be seen. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Katindi. I want to pass the mic to you, Barbara, uh, the two minutes as, as, we, as, as we wrap it up so that we can ask questions. But I want us to disrupt. Tell us, how can we disrupt the cycle of unfulfilled international commitments to truly deliver tangible results to the African woman, to that woman in uh, uh, that Katindi has mentioned, and or in Garissa or somewhere in Somaliland. So, how do we disrupt? Teach us. Well, that that seems to be quite the tallest, quite of the tallest orders. How to disrupt? Uh, yes. My personal view is disruption. When you want, when you want to know that water has boiled, you you check it from the top, but boiling begins at the bottom. Uh, to get the water to boil, to get the disruption to work, we must start with us at the grassroots level. So, by building the capacity, by working together, you know, every time people say this SDG promise of leaving no one behind. Sometimes I think it's such mm. a catch that we don't really think about its implication. Because if you're leaving no one behind, 
you're doing all that you can to make sure that you're all moving together. Either it is at the same pace or in the same bus, just making sure that, that the destination, the journey is not just focusing on, on, on the destination, but even in the process itself, that we all move together. And that is one way of mm. Mm. So for me, is by making sure that these grassroots women, all of us understand what our roles are in the society. And we understand what our duties mm. are, what our responsibilities mm. are in the society. Mm. By beginning mm. that particular form of empowerment where everyone is aware of their right and not just aware as in informed, like they know that, mm -hmm. yeah, we know that there is the Universal Declaration on Human Rights. We know that there is the yeah. Convention Against uh, Violence, I mean, Convention Against Violence Against Women. But truly, you know, manifesting that in how they live their day-to-day -day lives by checking to see when we talk about the rights of the woman or the rights of the child or the rights of a human being, for example, say the right to assemble, it is a right that is embodied by everyone within the community, mm -hmm. not others thinking, well, if the state says A, then the state is correct and the state then the state can do whatever it means. It means we have a people that are empowered to even check the state. Remember, mm -hmm. the only way we can have responsible states is if the citizens themselves rise up and realize that all these mm -hmm. institutions are, are um, undertaking rights and responsibilities that have been given to them as agents. We as the people are the principles. And by virtue of being the principles mean, mean that we then control all these processes and they work for us. Remember, being in government is to serve. It is a calling to serve. It is not a calling to be served. The government does not, is not served by its people. It serves its people. So by making sure that the communities understand that that is the relationship they should then be having by governments, by calling them, taking them to account. You know, when sometimes you're doing some sensitization, people tell you, oh, well, they would never listen to us. But it is us who put mm. them in the power. It is us who give mm. them responsibilities. So until and unless uh, there is a common understanding by everyone, every African, that first and foremost, governments exist to serve us, but secondly, they discharge these duties as our agents, not our principles. We mm. are principles. They discharge it as our principles. And thirdly, and most importantly, that no one is above the law. Absolutely no one. That the law exists to be applied equally to everyone. That yes, there are some mm. times when you must look at in instances where you give other opportunities or rather you give other people a bit of um, uh, sort of like leeway for them to tell their stories, but that is because of the nuances that affect them. For example, if you're going to be dealing with, uh, for example, a, a, a group of people that has been uh, vulnerable for a very long time, maybe they have not had the same access to services or institutions or processes as the others, then it means that you must take time to explain to them what their rights and responsibilities are. But when you're dealing with the elite, then the assumption is, and it's a correct assumption that they understand, or rather they know what the law is. They may not understand it, but they would know. So once you have an enlightened mm -hmm. and empowered community, then you're able to take to task or to take mm. uh, to call upon institutions to deliver on their mandates for you, which will also include the international, um, the international institutions. But before we get to the international institutions right there, I must say that before we even get to multilateral agencies like the UN, IDLO and the rest, the first question is, what are we doing ourselves for the agencies that are serving us at the grassroots level? Because you cannot say that you want the mango that is at the highest point of the tree when you have a mango that you can pick that is within your arm's reach. It's, it's very ridiculous to be saying you're dying of hunger, yet you can access all these mangoes close to you. So it's important. And I don't know whether um, if I would be rephrasing it correctly or I think my 
best phrase is in the analysis that was done for the Chinua Achebe novels uh, on colonization. Mm -hmm. When you look at Things Fall Apart and Arrow of God, Things Fall Apart was written just before um, independence and Arrow of God was written after independence. And both of them were written just be before any war uh, erupted between the village groups. And you could see that the one that had the biggest impact was Arrow of God. And it means therefore, that we as a people have the right and had, have had the knowledge, especially as Africans, to divert situations that can cause us harm. So which means that even when we're thinking of disrupting uh, the global norms to be able to make sure that uh, the, the, the fact of the future actually is delivered and um, enforced, if that is a word, I don't think we can say enforced, but actually delivered because it's a promise uh, to the future generation and to us who are still here, then it means that we must um, collectively begin to utilize um, our special skills as Africans. We were very good storytellers. I'm sure we still are. It's just that we've stopped writing as much as we used to. We have a very rich resource within Africa, which means we must be able to be, uh, start utilizing our resources in a manner that will benefit everyone, not just a select few. And once we do that, once we start to see that, uh, that going forward by applying good governance, we are able to actually resolve our own issues, then others will be willing to invest mm. in us in issues that we prioritize, not issues that they prioritize, because I think that's very important. In development world, what works best, strategies that work best are strategies that have been adopted and uh, accepted by the people and priorities that have been seen to be important by the people themselves, because they then um, uh, work with you to actualize them. But when you bring on board foreign policies or foreign strategies, that they do not understand becomes very difficult to actualize those or to 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 reach or to realize any um, achievement from those strategies. So it's always best to begin at the very lower level, bring everyone on board, work with them, work with them in the journey, give them the capacity that they need to work at your pace or even faster, so that we can all get to this destination that we seem to be interested in getting at. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Aiden. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Barbara. Yeah, the solutions are within. Let's get this lower mango first before we aim to. I, I love that analogy. Thank you so much. I want to give this now to Grace to wrap it up for us. Uh, I want you to dream. Here is an open check. You have received an open check. Help us dream. Tell us. What would a technology curriculum designed entirely for African women look like? And how would it differ from current models? So that when we live here, we know this is that, that elusive future is now here closer than we ever thought. Well, picking it up from uh, what uh, Dr. Katindi has just said, we start with the low li the low lying fruits. You know that mango that is just right there where you can pick it. And one among the things is contextualizing. How can we focus on those local challenges? Because now we have that where we have the global outlook, right? But even when we come to translating it, it has to be as contextualized as possible. Whatever a woman who's here in Mombasa needs in order for her to like achieve that status is very different from what a lady in Nairobi needs. So now the very first thing is, can we be able to have a curriculum? Even right now when we're talking about, uh, I'll even give this, the CBC. Yes, it's the same at the national level, but then it has to be as contextualized as possible for it uh, to be able to even bear fruits. Now here I'm looking at, are you able to look at that area? Uh, the different climatic condition, the different health uh, challenges that are happening, the different agricultural practices that can be done, the culture that is right there. Because then when you start and you want to bring in what was discussed or, uh, you know, we, we are Africans and I'll, I'll say this, we are very big on copy and paste, but then it has to stop. Mm -hmm. 
at, at, at some point, yes? Mm -hmm. you, you go, you see something working at another place, but then when you come, uh, just look at, for me to be able to achieve these results, how am I able to contextualize it as much as possible in order for me to be able to bring about problem solving? You know, the other thing becomes now inclusive, just incorporate everybody. In that environment, they're different people. You know, you have ladies who are, like we said, uh, you know, yesterday, when, I mean, was it the day before yesterday when we were catching up and we were looking at how do we define an African woman? So how do we be as inclusive mm. as possible? From that corporate uh, lady who has that blue collar job or that white collar job, you know, that top uh, headhunter right there to that mamboga who's down on there how do we ensure that all these are you know as included as possible we are not looking at marginalizing so that you know once you contextualize you're able to bring about equity let me use that word i hope i'm using it in the best way possible but then even as you're doing that mm -hmm. you have to come mm -hmm. to a point where uh, you're ensuring that ethical ways ethical procedures you know are being followed right and right now, I'll even put, um, you know, the emphasis when you're looking at leaders, we need to look at what are the ethics that we are promoting? You know, what are, what do they stand for? You know, uh, we are coming into a digital world, right? How do we ensure safety? How do we ensure data privacy, even for the people who are, and we are engaging or we are engaging with them? And then later on, how do we now, after we have looked at uh, focusing on the local challenges, we have looked at uh, the inclusive representation, and we have also looked at mm. ethics. Now we look at now what are the skills that we mm. need, right? Mm. Uh, how do we equip this person? And now you see this one comes from the context of the, the history of this person. Right now, if I was to empower you, wait there, uh, and I look at empowering you and I copy paste from empowering a Swahili woman, it, it's going to be very, very different for you. And if I take a solution that was made for a Swahili woman and maybe take it to Botswana, I, I'm going to be taking very different things. So now it becomes, what are the practical skills, right? So now I'll give this example. Uh, when we look at our traditional African, you know, practices, right? You have the different communities that had the different skills, right? We had the weavers, we had the farmers, we had the, you know, all those. Now, if I want to like now bring about entrepreneurial skills, I won't start coming and talking about tech when this person has never even heard about tech. I'll try and relate it to them as much as possible in order for me to empower them from that context. So for me, that, that, that's what, when I'm even uh, building up curriculums uh, for engaging either schools or educators or even learners themselves, those are the things that I need to look at. At the baseline, what is the skill that I need? And when I'm building up this skill, what am I banking on? And it's not out of my own memory. No, I have to understand the person that I'm making this curriculum for, right? Who are they? Uh, what do they need? How do they need to move uh, to the next, uh, uh, you know, space? How do I make them or how do I ensure that they are able to move to that entire space? So now that's how, it, that, that's how I can sum it up. Hey, there. Hmm. Thank you so much, Grace. Thank you. What I hear is contextualize the skills first, uh, bring it down and make it uh, relatable. And Oh my God, I feel like this webinar should have been a two day conference. <laughs> and uh, yeah, because there's so much you talk about, there's so much passion in the room. So I want to say a big thank you. Uh, first to you, Grace, as well, all the way. Uh, it's a busy season where you've taken time. Thank you, Barbara, all the way uh, in the PAL of Africa. You're here with us. I appreciate your moment. Thank you, Rutendo. Thank you for speaking passionately, especially around trade. I, I, I really love it. Thank you, Dr. Katindi, for your strategic foresight. Do you see what I did there? And uh, in harnessing this conversation and making it richer. Um, I want to hand this over to Mr. Rashid, just to check if we have any questions that have come up. But even as we do that, I want to say next month, we have our closeout uh, series and we'll be talking about uh, systems practice for social impact. It's gonna be hosted by one of our own, uh, Ms. Butile, 
who is also in this call. And what's amazing about this conversation is that we are partnering with Food for the Hungry. Uh, wow, you don't, you don't want, you don't want to, to miss this one. So it's a hybrid event, which is a very good thing. And uh, Miss Mutile, who, who, I don't know, she'll, she'll, she'll bring the flavor around system thinking. So Dr. Katindi is a run for your money. Uh, people are coming right after you. So we're going to be talking about systems, pra practice, and uh, for social impact. Um, I don't know if there are any questions. Um, if not, uh, um, Mr. Mota, can I hand this to you? Or do I wrap it up? If you want me to wrap it up, you can give me a thumbs up. There are no questions. Uh, yeah, I think you can wrap it up. And uh, also thank you for introducing next month's last Thursday. So yes, go ahead and wrap it up. Okay, it's a wrap. No? Not, okay, <laughs> not like that. Okay, fine, fine. <laughs> so we will be sending out mail. Thank you for everyone who has joined us and stayed with us uh, for this conversation. We will be sharing our insights paper on this conversation and the great um, just what we've spoken about, the analogies about contextualized trade, minimize that gap as much as possible. Next time I'm taking a loan, I will ask myself, does it translate to the mamamboga? Uh, or am, am I part of the harassment? Uh, thank you, Barbara, for the analogy of the mango. And you know, it's mango season where Katindi comes from. So, yeah. <laughs> so I am really grateful. Go so make Africa great. Thank you very much. My name is Wedera Kibinda. I'm your favorite thought provoker and conversation starter. And until next Thursday, <laughs> uh, God bless you. Yes, Katinga, I'll be your friend. Please send the mangoes over. And also, she, you talked about trade, export them to Uganda. Thank you. And uh, it's a wrap. See you. Thank you.